Well, my, the first line of my talk is I'm very grateful to John, but really, I'm very lucky to be here. Um, John has given us the tour of Nelson today, but knock your socks off. I, I would love to live in this community. I just would love to live here. You have so many good things going on, um, so much hope and promise. You're very lucky to be here. You must love it here. It's a good thing I love where I live, where I, I would be moving here. <laughs> but, I, but I am grateful to John and to the many sponsors of this event and to everyone here for this evening. For my husband and I, Kip, telling our story at this particular time in our lives has probably means more to us than even we can imagine. Creating this presentation for you has asked us to go back in time to pull together the threads of our 35 years together and especially the last 30 years of activist publishing work. Uh, it's a very poignant time for us personally as we deal with perhaps our greatest challenge ever it is also, I believe, a crucial time in our collective story of freedom and resistance to oppression. I believe it's no accident that the first telling the world premiere of our story really is here in Nelson because it's such a, an amazing hotbed of resistance and renewal. I'm very, very lucky tonight to have my eldest daughter with me, Julie Radish. Um, she must have married the right man, morphing as she did from a plant to a radish. <laughs> <laughs> And I should just say that my other daughter, Shannon, is uh, holding the fort at home and taking good care of Kip. And I'm very grateful to both of them. Julie has been with New Society for 17 years, beginning work with us with her first newborn slung on her hip as she packed up book orders, which I think is one of the best jobs in the company. Now the chief operating officer, she has her finger on the pulse of this company. Beginning her work for social change years ago as a founding member of the BC Green Party at the young age of 18, she soon after helped us get the new catalyst up and running. I would not be standing here this evening if it weren't for the, the 12 dedicated, committed, brilliant, kind and passionate, loving people that I work with every single day. Together we publish 25 or so new books a year and I am deeply grateful. More than words can ever say to these folks, they have always rallied and never wavered even during our darkest times and we have great parties. And to the hundreds of activist authors that New Society has published since 1978, what a privilege it is to have collaborated with all of them. Um, they have trusted us with their work, their most precious work. Uh, we are partners in this project. And I thank every single one of them for their confidence. And to the hundreds of thousands of readers whose lives have been changed by New Society Publishers books, we know that you're out there changing the world every single day. Your courage and tenacity keeps us going. And finally, though you don't see him, I am standing here with Kip, my life partner. This is our tale. It is part love story. And I ask your indulgence in this. I couldn't tell it any other way. It's also political. Kip's a very political person. From his early work in his young life for an independent and nuclear free Pacific, uh, he learned from his mentors there. And he later taught me that our task as publishers is to enable others to be their catalyst. Kip would, of course, be here if he could be. He offers up this slideshow. <laughs> Pictures do tell a thousand words. So please sit back. It's a long story. <laughs> But it is storytelling time, and we do have pictures. A more honorable beginning for a book publishing company would be hard to find. Our time to take the reins at New Society Publishers would be a good 10 to 14 years after the first broadsheets, pamphlets, and books, and the first bound book hit the streets. So my telling of the story of these early days comes from conversations with David Albert, one of the founders of NSP and, our, and one of our mentors in this business. The Movement for a New Society, or MNS, the genesis of New Society Publishers was a Quaker-based activist collective that began in 1971 as a response to the Vietnam War and most likely was the foundation of the anti-nuclear movement in the, in the US. Uh, it was a collective that was organized to facilitate, training, facilitate trainings and nonviolent civil disobedience, a, a practice that no one really knew much about in the US at that time. Following in the footsteps of the theory and practice of Martin Luther King and, and Gandhi, M&S would eventually acquire several old mansions in Philadelphia where folks would come 
and uh, take training sessions um, and set up temp sort of temporary communities in these big mansions. There's a, a whole lovely little book that AK Press has put out that tells the story of, uh, of, of, the, of this pro project in Philadelphia and, and what actually happened. It, it's kind of interesting. It's very interesting. Anyways, training materials were needed. Pamphlets were created with titles like Why Nonviolence? and were distributed in quantities of 500 or so at a time. And the whole operation was funded by donations. Over half a million copies of Why Nonviolence would eventually be in circulation. As David describes it, the collective was a book packing company, and out of this grew a book publishing company. It's quite the reverse of what usually goes on. The first book, The Resource Manual for a Living Revolution, published in 1978, was uh, you know, affectionately known as the Monster Manual because it contained all you needed to know, uh, anything and everything to transform society towards peace and nonviolence. And it was a one-of-a-kind publication. The newly formed book publishing collective knew nothing about book publishing and had little or no self-discipline, as David describes it. They did know that the best way to sell books was to publish a bunch of them. So in the early 80s, they produced six books, funding them on advance sales. Joanna Macy's Despair and Personal Power in the Nuclear Age, Pam McAllister's Reweaving the Web of Life, and the Barbara Demi Reader most likely carried them the first few years. Reweaving -re probably sold 30,000 copies in all. And I bought one in 1982 and it changed my life, as NSP books tend to do. There is much, much more to tell about the origins of New Society publishers, and I'm encouraging David Albert to write this story for us. But I do offer these tidbits just to set my own more personal story in context. So, how we got involved in more ways than one. I was 30. He was 29. I was a single mom with three kids. He had no money. <laughs> We met in the SFU library while hanging back on a rather dull but, but essential tour for new students. To distract ourselves from the tedium, we started talking, finding out quickly that we were in the same department, communications. It was 1978, just a few years after SFU and the communications department had made history, <clears throat> with its radical student movement, followed by the crushing reality of the dismissal of most of the radical professors. I was most definitely not interested in developing a relationship that would upset my focus on the exciting uh, adventure of returning to school. I had worked hard in Fort McMurray to save enough money to get me and my kids uh, to Vancouver and to get started on this journey to school. I was, I was anxious, but I was energized. He pursued me for days. <laughs> As he approached me across, across the quadrangle, I said to a friend, this is it, I'm ditching this guy. Instead, we went for coffee. I paid <laughs> and started to talk. My jaw dropped as Kip told me where he'd been the last seven years of his life. He had come to SFU on a Commonwealth scholarship and the money hadn't arrived yet. To research the viability of satellite communication as a tool for the independence movements in the various tiny South Pacific countries, mostly in Melanesia and Micronesia. All of this was just the tip of the iceberg. Kip had been one of the primary organizers for the first nuclear free and independent Pacific movement conferences in the South Pacific where nuclear bomb testing had already occurred with devastating consequences in Mororoa and the Marshall Islands. In addition to this, he was the personal aid and speech writer for Walter Leaney, who was an Anglican priest from Pentecost Island, one of the outer islands of the group of islands then known as the New Hebrides, and the leader of the independence movement, taking on both the French and English colonizers of that country. Father Linney did succeed a few years later and became the first prime minister, prime minister renaming the islands Vanuatu, and Kip became his adopted brother. We didn't stop talking for a month. I had come from Fort McMurray. My own story was interesting enough, and I had reached remarkably similar conclusions to Kip, uh, as Kip had come to with his seemingly more worldly experience. I had worked at the Nistuwayu Native Friendship Center. Uh, I was the only non-First Nations person amongst many angry and disenfranchised people. I had been hired as executive director by a board of directors to clean up the books and get the organization back on its feet. No one talked to me for six months. <laughs> I sat in my office and read, Aquasassini Notes mostly, the radical newspaper from the Six Nations people, and Macaur Magazine, a beautiful feminist journal from Vancouver. I learned a huge amount. 
and had my, my assumptions about how the world worked turned upside down. Add this new knowledge to the reality of my life, the ridiculousness of trying to raise and provide for three children in the tragic environment of Fort McMurray and here. Here was a recipe for personal change on a dramatic level. So it wasn't with the ambition of, uh, you know, of increasing my chances as a good paying job that I turned towards the university, but it was with this question to seek answers to my problem. How could I change my life so that I can provide a healthy and sane world for myself and my kids? And so too was Kip wrestling with this question, but his came from a more political perspective. How can we deal with a world that is colonized to the core? What can be done to alter this killing course? Our love story began here. Instead of being distracted by love, we were thoroughly inspired and engaged by endlessly discovering our common ground. But it wasn't until we met Fred Brown that things really took off for us, at least intellectually. Fred's life story is well documented elsewhere, and I have a couple of copies of his biography with me, um, which Otter Books will kindly sell to you if you'd like to buy one. Um, suffice to say that here was the most scholarly person I had ever met. I understood little of what he said, not having done the decades of reading required to follow his thought, except from time to time I did get it. When he talked about community, about recreating culture where, where people were willing to question their own individualistic and alienated behavior and instead asking us to act as if people really could decide together how to best make up a coherent group, like a tribe, but self-consciously organizing ourselves. This was exciting stuff for Kip and I. Fred was in the process of leaving the university nearing retirement age and fed up with the departmental politics. He and his family and a few dedicated students were heading for the interior to settle on a piece of land, embarking on building the new world. Kip and I were finished our degrees, accepted into further graduate work, but we really needed to break from the concrete walls of SFU. I got a job in New Ianch in Niska Territory, 65 miles north of Terrace, and we were lucky enough to rent a trapper's cabin just outside the village. There we lived as a little family for two years, decompressing from the city, but keeping in touch with Fred and the ongoing commune experiment. In the summer of 1983, Kip and I and, our, and Julie went to visit Fred and friends at Camelsfoot, the 180-acre ranch nestled in the mountains, accessible only by mountain trail in winter, and a treacherous seven-mile route that took an hour to drive in the summertime. This was the commune's Shangri-La. They were beginning the massive task of installing a Pelton mill hydroelectric, hydroelectric system meant to generate enough power for a small village, and clearly they needed our help. At least that was our excuse for embarking on an adventure that would change our lives forever. So the day we arrived at Camel's Foot with all our stuff, piano, chickens, books, toys, etc., was also the day Fred was given the news that he had terminal cancer. So the next two years, so rarely an easy time, were precious. Suffice to say that once bitten by the idea of humans as social creatures and the vision of living together and caring in viable groups, there is no turning back. Our library at the foot was massive. Our conversations, endlessly interesting. Our day-to-day -day relations, well, that's where we were babes in the woods. Fred died at the end of that first year, surrounded by community. The second year, things began to unravel. Kip and I, being relative newcomers, felt we needed to put some distance between ourselves and the tangled net of relationships our mentor had left behind. Luckily, we were able to acquire the property at the bottom of the trail. Moving in with our eldest daughter and her boyfriend, we felt like refugees. We were broke and disenfranchised, disenchanted. I had to leave my family that winter for a job in Vancouver. As luck would have it, I worked for Fed Up Food Co-op. Kip and I had been members of Fed Up since SFU, like the Camel's Foot folks and friends in Terrace and hundreds of others. Fed Up began in the early 70s, initially funded by a grant from the NDP government of $20,000. Members as far away as the Yukon and all around the province, who all took their turn doing, doing work weeks in the warehouse in Vancouver, Fed Up had been a real connecting force amongst the alternative back to the landers who wanted access to good quality bulk food. Twice a year, Fed Up put out a price list, a broadsheet, with all the bulk items listed, order forms, and so on. The center spread was the price list, 
Now the other eight pages were dedicated to news and views from the member groups, each group taking their turn to create the pages. We called ourselves the Bridge River people, and like all the member groups, when it was our turn, we spent many days uh, handcrafting these pages with art, poems, and pieces of writing. The whole publication was called The Catalyst, the list part being the price list. And you know, I've got some of them here, lots of them, so please afterwards go and rifle through them, it would be good for them. <laughs> Sadly, oh, and this is Allie Lang's work. She's, she's part of your community now, and she, she did this. Sadly, but inevitably, Fed Up had to close, close its doors. Bulk food was now available in most grocery stores, and people in the regions gradually lost interest in doing work weeks in Vancouver. In fact, part of my job was to figure out what should be done with this languishing organization. Our little household, Kip and I, and Julie and her then partner, Kelly, talked a lot about this when I would come back from the city. The valuable part to us was the kata part of the catalyst, that part that connected people. We were also struggling with forestry issues in Bridge River, and we knew others around the province must be in the same boat. We needed to stay in touch if only to share strategies. So we worked hard on a proposal to the Fed Up Board of Directors to keep the eight-page eight wraparound section of the Catalyst, keep the membership list, and launch a new publication called The New Catalyst. We made a bit for the $20,000 to, to use as seed money, and simultaneously we asked for an explorations grant from the Canada Council for $12,000. After many tense meetings and a lot of tough questions, the board passed on the money, and the Canada Council gave us the, gave us the grant, so we were launched. And the first issue of the new catalyst came out in the fall of 1986, and it was called Moving On, the State of the Movement. Gas was cheaper in those days, and it was a good thing. We drove a couple of hundred miles with our floppy disk to Vancouver, where baseline type and graphics, a cooperative business, turned it into columns of type. <clears throat> they also let us use their light tables and office space after hours. Kip and I often worked most of the night laying out the pages with sharp knives, glue, and line tape, delivering the finished product to the printer first thing in the morning. Next day, we picked up the hundreds of bundles of hot off the press new catalysts and delivered them by truck all around the city to bookstores, health food stores, anywhere, anywhere that would take them, picking up the money from the sales of the last issue. Then we would drive home up, back up to Fraser Canyon to quickly send out the several thousand copies on the subscription list and build the advertisers. Our living room turned into a post office as we bundled and sorted according, according to Canada Post's mailing system for bulk rate. We'd hoped to produce six issues a year, but we had to limit it to a quarter. It was just, it was just too much. We partnered with, with the Western Canada Wilderness Committee on one issue, printing 50,000 copies. The living room was a mail sorting room for a week. Our son conscript, conscripted into tying up and labeling bundles, saying, I'm only 12 years old, <laughs> as we seemingly endlessly loaded up the one-ton community truck. Well, creating the new catalyst wasn't all we were doing. We were also homeschooling, growing and preserving lots of food, including meat, eggs, milk, making cheese, defending our little valley from the constant threat of logging. The Stein Valley just down the road was a huge issue for us, as was the proposed toxic waste up at Cache Creek, where Vancouver's garbage would end up. All the while, we were continuing to rework our dream of community. The need to connect with others of like mind put us in touch with the bioregional movement. Such an awkward word, but elegantly written about by literary greats like Gary Snyder, Peter Berg, and Wendell Berry, and then activists like Freeman House. Learning to live within the gifts and limitations of a particular place, creating a culture of place. These were ideas that were right up our alley. I was so excited to connect with these folks. In 1986, I was invited to speak on ecofeminism and bioregionalism at the North American Bioregional Congress in Michigan. Four of us piled into our little car and drove there and, and slept under the stars and fields and so on, because we were so broke. I gave my talk to the several hundred folks gathered under the main tent. <clears throat> it was one of many presentations and events over the next four or five days. And there were exhibits and tables and brochures and maps and a book table with a bold sign that said, please, touch the books. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping the peace. We are all part of one another. Reweaving the web of life and so on. This was New Society Publishers with Ellen Sawslock and David Albert, two of the NSP Collective, in lively conversation with people around the table. 
based in Philadelphia. This was a publisher who went looking for its readers and writers, which was just what was going on. Alongside the table, a chair had been set up, an author's chair, for anyone who wanted to talk about a pu possible publishing project. Kip and I took turns in that chair. Kip had a book in his head on the peace movement in the South Pacific, Waves of Freedom. My topic was ecofeminism and biomutualism. We talked on and off for the next few days, beginning a relationship with these folks and this organization, the organization that would stay with us for the rest of our lives, though we certainly did not know that then. My book ended up being published by the Society Publishers in 1989. Killing the Wounds, The Promise of Ecofeminism was a book that I actually needed in my own life. And as it turned out, it fit the bill for many others too. And David and Ellen became friends. We collaborated with Ellen Wright and Van Andrus, two of the original Camelsford folks who we had lived with during our time on the commune, to create a truly wonderful anthology called Home of My Original Leader. It was around the development of this project, and no doubt the signing of the contract, that David and Ellen made a house call to Camelsford, walking up the long mountain trail. Publishers that make house calls. So now we had books and a magazine on the go, as well as everything else. We had a tiny turbo wheel on the creek that powered our Osborne computer that churned out the print for both of these projects. This power system worked well until the temperature hit seven below, and then nothing we could do could keep it going. While working on the ecofeminism issue of the new catalyst, the temperature dropped. Kip and I headed to the water line with blow torch in hand. It was futile. I remember thinking how ironic it was to be trying to keep this system going while crafting words about living within the gifts and limitations and ceasing to exploit nature and so on. <laughs> And putting the battery in the truck and driving it around for a while, charged it up and worked in a pinch, but really, it felt a little antithetical to everything we stood for. <laughs> Communication beyond our inside word factory was via a radio telephone with listening hours, using a simplex system, meaning that only one party could speak at a time while anyone else on the system could listen into at least one side of the conversation. We inquired with EC Tell about the possibility of a real phone line. $90,000 for our share of the bill. And all the while, David Suzuki was pleading with the world that we had only a decade to turn things around. The turnaround decade, he was claiming, was a crucial window for making real change. At the same time, David and Ellen were encouraging us to consider taking on more book projects, maybe even open up a Canadian New Society of Publishers. David muttered in our ears, you know, you would probably reach more people with books and magazines. And relations in our household were deteriorating. Social life is so fragile, and we demand so much of each other and ourselves. And ours was an excessively busy life. Kip and I were full of ambition. Not everyone wanted or needed the same goals. After much handling, conversation, and some anguish, Kip and I decided to leave the Bridge River, but only for the turnaround decade, to see what we could do with our virgin publishing work, to see if we could help make a difference. And so it was, with books and magazines in hand, all our gear, all our hopes and fear, and every cent we could find, that we moved ourselves to Gabriola Island in 1990. Susan Yates and Laurie McBride, both Gabrielans and activists, encouraged us in their direction. We knew Susan through the Gabriola Island Peace Association, and Laurie through her work with the St. George Strait and the George Strait Alliance. Still in all, it was tough to leave the Bridge River, where all our dreams of community and a new world had been born. But then, it was just for the next 10 years. After much discussion with the whole New Society Publishers Collective in Philadelphia and a couple of trips to the city of Brother Love, we established a working relationship based on what we loosely described as a mutual aid agreement, borrowing from the gentle anarchist Peter Kropotkin's ideas that cooperation and mutual aid are the most important factors in the evolution of species and the, and, and the ability to survive. That certainly felt right to us. For a while, we continued to publish the new catalyst, but it, it quickly became apparent that we couldn't do both books in a magazine. The magazine soon morphed into books, the new catalyst by a region series, small volumes of 144 pages each to a year. The first was Turtle Talk, Forces for a Sustainable Future, which Kip and I edited as we did the next several, several of the series. We produced nine in all, the last being Our Ecological Footprint by Bill Reese and Matthew Swaggernaut, which would become a signature book for the emerging 
uh, Canadian New Society Publishers. For five years, Kip and I operated a satellite office of New Society Publishers from our tiny space between our house and the chicken coop. We made editorial decisions together with the Philadelphians, marketed and sold the books to the Canadian trade, maintained an active direct mail business, but kept a separate set of financial books. Both organizations functioned under not for, a not-for-profit umbrella societies in Philadelphia, the uh, New Society Educational Foundation, NSEF, and in Canada, Catalyst Education Society. Kip and I traveled to England and met progressive publishers, booksellers, writers, and activists there. Some of these organizations have collaborated with NSP through the Philadelphia office, and some we hoped would in the future. In Canada, I visited Toronto uh, to try to convince a distributor to take us on. Not an easy task. These books were primarily American-centered. The Canada Council told us that the books had poor production values. In other words, the covers were boring, and the interior design was well, maybe a little more professional looking, and the authors were not eligible for grant money, being non Canadian, and the subject matter was most definitely not literary. It was tough. Kip and I took turns being employed as there just wasn't enough money coming in from book sales to keep both of us on the payroll. This didn't mean that we both didn't work. We did. We worked all the time. If we weren't actually cranking out words on the page, we were talking about it strategizing, working on connecting the dots of the perceived need for activist materials, what would sell, how we could stay alive in the book publishing milieu. We also grew a large garden and kept on expanding the office as well as building a log cabin in the orchard, which would eventually become part of the NSP offices as well. And the Philadelphians for an F2F, for a face-to-face. -face. It was a week of meetings, mostly held in Philadelphia, but we hosted the whole gang of Gabriel as well. During these meetings, we presented our financial statements, went over covers, decided on many details that we could work out better together than apart. Really, the fax machine had only just been introduced. It was an amazing event where we could fax draft cover designs between the offices, because part of that we had to mail them. It was during one of these F2Fs that it was revealed to the whole collective that things were not going well in Philadelphia. The Philadelphia organization was built on an interpretation of the Quaker model that held that everybody has a piece of the truth. Decision making went on and on and on. The collective sensibility and the need to have everyone feel included in an equal part of the company meant that people took turns in various roles within the organization. Everyone wanted to be an editor. Few people wanted to do typesetting and nobody wanted to water the plants. <laughs> Some folks had been at NSP for 10 years, others a few months. Some had years of activist involvement, and others were young anarchists. Computer technology was relatively new, and the bookkeeper, a kind and lovely soul, he refused to computerize the financial data. He did everything by handwritten ledger, ledgers, royalties, financial statements, budgets. Sales were down in 1995. America was saber rattling. It was a depressing time for peace activists and progressive book publishers alike. At this particular F2F, it was revealed that the organization was in financial difficulty. More than that, it appeared that money had been loaned to the organization that not everybody knew about. Paychecks were not being cashed. We found them under the waters. Uh, cashed by some so that other expenses could be met. Uh, the building that had been bought at more flush times needed serious repair, and payments were overdue. On top of all of this, the folks in the collective that had been with NSP since the beginning, they were burnt out. They'd had enough and wanted to move on in their lives. It was a recipe for collapse. But Kemp and I weren't ready to pack it in. In fact, we felt like we were just getting going. I remember clearly sitting in an airport lounge on the way home from that devastating F2F as it dawned on us that if we could figure out how we could probably end up with the entire New Society publishers under our wings, but how? We have lots of enthusiasm, but no money. As a not-for-profit, the Catalyst Education Society, the legal entity that, whose project was New Society Publishers in Canada, was originally mandated with terms that were political, that is to say world-changing in our opinion. Too political for the government to allow donors to deduct, deduct gifts from their taxes. Knowing this, Kip and I approached a fancy law firm in Vancouver to see if we could rewrite our terms of reference, making us friendlier to the CRA. <laughs> 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 
The lawyer sent us back home with piles of work to do. Meanwhile, the Philadelphians were desperately trying to find a solution in the U.S., and some were sure they wanted new society publishers to move to Canada. Understandably. The pressure was on for us as we didn't want to lose this potential opportunity. One afternoon, while pulling orders off the fax machine, out came our salvation. Some Nigerian chief had died and left us all his money. <laughs> <laughs> I remember sending books to Nigeria not that long ago, and now all that shipping expense was paying off. All I had to do was send them our bank account. <laughs> Just as I was about to hit the send button, we thought maybe we should consult a lawyer. So for $100, we, we consulted one of our neighbors. And he said, never, ever give anybody your bank account details. <laughs> yes. Shortly after this embarrassing fiasco, the Vancouver lawyer called. She asked us how we were doing with the rewrite, and then said that she'd been approached by someone we might want to meet. His name was Joel Solomon, and he'd like to talk to us about New Society Publishers. Joel Solomon, I knew that name. The new Catalyst subscription list was very familiar to me. Even with 2,000 plus names, I felt like they were all known to me. I looked him up. Joel Solomon from Tennessee and Cortez Island. We had few subscribers from Tennessee, so his name stood out. We agreed to meet in Vancouver, Isadora's on Granville Island. Isadora's was an employee-owned restaurant that had offered up shares to investors when it was getting up and running. Fed up had bought shares and passed them on to us. Dividends were paid in restaurant meals. It was a great scheme, and we'd used it many times. So we met for lunch. We left at four. Joel turned our heads around. Yes, he said, I can probably find you some donation money if you get your tax status sorted out. But, and here's the head-turning bit, I could really help you out a lot more if you were a for-profit. To keep an eye, the corporate world was the enemy. At the bottom of all the issues that we had taken on in our work was capitalist greed. How could we possibly turn away from this point of view? It wasn't Joel's beautiful Tennessee that Joel that convinced us, not entirely anyway. Was it our feeling of desperation? The more we talked, the more excited I became. I felt energized and I couldn't understand why. We both felt the stirrings of empowerment as we began to enter the psychological space of the entrepreneur. Joel was launching Renewal Partners, a venture capital business with a big difference. He was acting on behalf of Cal Newell, a woman of wealth who would years later receive the Order of Canada for her philanthropic and innovative business collaborations. Together, Joel and Carol were strategizing about investing her significant personal wealth in British Columbia's, in British Columbia's economy by partnering with businesses who were working with the triple bottom line, financial, social, and environmental success is a threefold objective, that is to say not just profit for the shareholders. New society publishers have the potential to fill, fit the bill. I had had my head turned around before. I once had the great honor of presenting with Thomas Berry, the radical and much loved Jesuit priest, at a Catholic retreat center in Ontario. As if listening to Thomas talk about the great work and the dream of the earth, from his spiritual cosmolog cosmological point of view wasn't enough to shift a diehard anti-religion person like myself. Here I met radical nuns whose work and very presence was awe-inspiring, to the point where I could imagine that if the Catholic Church could become a voice for environmental social change, that this would provide an extremely powerful pivot for influencing huge numbers of people. Prior to this revelation, I had most definitely considered religion to be the opium of the masses, I think I still do, uh, and I would not consider that any cracks in my worldview were possible. So similarly, the idea that capitalism could have potential power as a game changer was not at all in my lexicon. Nevertheless, my head was turning once again. We took the plunge and we formed a corporation and together with renewal partners went to the business development bank, put our property on the line as collateral, and got some more money. Making a bid to the Philadelphians for the entire list, the name, the ISBNs, the files, and everything but the kitchen sink and those house plans. We made an offer that couldn't be refused. Amazingly, we were up and running by the fall of 1996. 
We released our ecological footprint in the fall of that year, in spite of some American fellow travelers muttering that the notion of sustainability was just not something that US people knew or cared about. But the Reese Walker novel research showed that if everyone on the planet lived the North American lifestyle, we would need three more planets to draw on. Our unchecked ecological footprint was indeed a huge problem, like it or not. Many around the world agreed we went on to sell foreign rights for this title to at least seven different foreign language publishers, and our English edition went to reprint many, many times. And despite its dated content and design, we still sell several hundred copies a year. But this is getting ahead of the story. There we were, with some money in the bank, not much. Two computers, one brand new. A fax machine, two desks, and a book packing table. Just the two of us, full of nerves and determination. On our own, we hit the decks running. How will we build this business? New Society publishers in Philadelphia, based on a need for activist material for nonviolent social change, needed to be updated and brought into line with what Keith and I perceived to be the needs of activists in the late 1990s. Our passionate interests of community, environmentalism, feminism, and bioregionalism, born of our own experiences, grew naturally and logically from the earlier NSP passions around the work of Gandhi and Martin Luther King, nonviolent direct action, feminism, and the peace movement. So it was no accident that our ecological footprint became a foundational book for the newly rising NSP Phoenix. Along with our own book, Home, a bioregional reader, and Healing the Wounds, and similar books, we were off to the races. The Philadelphians had passed on a few exceptional titles to us as well. The Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making by Sam Keener, and most notably, John Taylor Gatto's Down Must Down. Initially, Kip and I made editorial decisions together, but he did all of the editor's work, the acquisition, the substantive, the copy editing, he did it all. He also did most of the page layout and proofing. <laughs> and he designed a few edits that we did as well as creating the direct mail pieces. I did all of the bookkeeping, maintained the mailing list, processed book orders, and packed the books, and tried my darndest to learn the venture of the page-making program. Mm -hmm. That seemed totally opaque to me. <laughs> I also liaised with sales reps and book distributors in both the US and Canada. Just prior to finalizing the deal with the Philadelphians, we had realized that we needed someone to give us a hand, at least to help pack up book orders. Julie had traveled in the early 90s, for a couple of years, ending up in Australia, where she and her boyfriend worked at a youth hostel. There she met Sue Custance, a young woman from Vancouver. They team teamed up and had a few adventures, picking fruit and camping with crocodiles, but these adventures are beyond the scope of my story. <laughs> Suffice to say that Sue and Julie became lifelong friends, and Sue revealed to Julie her desire to get into book publishing. When they both returned to BC, the time was perfect. We needed some, and Sue applied. She was our only applicant. <laughs> we hired her, and as luck would have it, she and her re recently acquired husband moved to Creola. We only had part-time work for her, four hours a week. She packed books, which is, to my mind, as I said earlier, the best job in the company. Soon after hiring Sue, we hired her son. Our son, Will, also part-time. Neither of them knew much about book publishing, but like us, we're excited by the prospect of learning the business. In the summer of 1997, they both would take a two-week intensive uh, publishing immersion course at SFU. Page design and typesetting had to be passed on to an expert in Greg Green eventually took on most of our books on a contract basis and was able to leave his job in the Nine Mark Marking needed lots of help, so on the recommendation of our son and his friends, we hired one of their pals, Sarah Reeves. I'm sure we could literally feel the company growing. We had one telephone line, and in fact, one phone. Will entered it one day. When he was hand over the receiver, he called across the room, Hey, Mom, if it's the White House, is it for you? Well, I thought he said the White Heart, one of the local pubs. Sure, I replied. It was Al Gore's office. Wanting several of our books. I think I became a little starry-eyed starry -eyed because I neglected to ask him for a credit card to pay for the six minutes. <laughs> it seemed our authors and their books were getting some attention. So just prior to the Philadelphians closing their doors, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of education in the publishing business, like it or not. It's, I hope it's not too tedious for you. But just prior to the Philadelphians closing their doors, we had negotiated our Canadian distribution arrangement with General Distribution Services in Mississauga. GDS was a division start publishing uh, in the US. We, were, we continued to be distributed by InBook. 
a consortium of independent publishers. This was an arrangement put in place by the Philadelphia, so we were very grateful for it. Along with sales reps, distributors are considered essential to getting books to booksellers. They are middlemen, though, taking a substantial chunk from sales and charging for every single service. And the smaller you are, the more you pay per title for everything. We were slightly different in that we hand-sold our books through book tables at events and through direct mail. Publisher who sells their own books directly to their readers is a strange anomaly in the traditional trade. But as an activist press, we knew we needed to be in touch with our readers and also potential authors. But how to play both sides of the territory? Jeff and I decided to focus on the book trade, which we did almost as a component of our continuing education in the, book and the publishing business. So we went to Book Expo America, Book Expo Canada, the American Library Association's annual trade show and conference, regional trade fairs, library shows, the London Book Fair, and even the Frankfurt International Book Fair. The Frankfurt Book Fair has seven pavilions, each with up to three floors. We were located in the Canada stand, all of the Canadian publishers and their exhibits, and temporary office spaces taking up about a quarter of one aisle of one floor in one pavilion. The number of new books represented at this fair is unfathomable. How do we manage to sell anything, given the vast quantities of publications each and every year? The glitz and glamour, the swag and the schmoozing that never seemed to end, it was a constant buzz. And Book Expo America, and it's foreign rights, do you sell foreign rights in Frankfurt? Book Expo America is much the same. And though, of course, it's, a sm it's smaller than the Frankfurt International Book Fair, it's still huge. Usually in New York, it's expensive. We felt like we were constantly spending large amounts of money in the hope that booksellers would notice us. We made swag, stuff we all get. For one book, Divorce Your Car by Katie Alford, we made little buttons featuring the book's name and I brazenly foisted them onto a group of librarians once at the American Library Association's trade show and, and fair, only to be met with, why would I want to do that? I love my car. We were most definitely not preaching to the choir. <laughs> this exchange was a red flag, though we didn't realize it at the time. After a few years of trade shows, we grew cynical. Booksellers were rapidly closing their doors due to the brutal incursion of the big box stores, including Walmart, Costco, and other unlikely book dealers. We continued with Book Expo America, BEA, for a few years, and we did receive some attention. I was awarded Woman Publisher of the Year from a trade journal, but after the tens of thousands of dollars in annoying, almost celebrity star atmosphere, we reached a point where we had enough. We wanted to meet the choir. Partnering with Co-op America, we were amongst the first uh, exhibitors at the Green Festival in San Francisco. The Green Festival was a pro project of Co-op America and Global Exchange. We were given a fantastic location, right in the center of the hall. Everyone had to walk right past it, and they did. Nearly 20,000 people over the course of the Friday through Sunday event. We sold hundreds of books, and many of our authors gave talks and met their readers. Music, good food, endless talk, this was more like it. We met so many interesting, like-minded, and kind people. <laughs> Eric Henry of TS Design stands out. I will never forget meeting him in a colossal downpour in San Francisco at our very first Green Festival. We were getting into the taxi in front of a hotel in what seemed like the middle of the street. Huge, dripping display cases and suitcases and ourselves trying to pay the driver all of a bit of a panic-stricken gong show. There he comes running across the street. Can I help you? And he did. Carting our gear with us, following into the hotel. He became a good friend, even coming to visit us on Gabriola. And most recently, we have signed, signed him for a big project. His company, TS Designs, is a clothing manufacturer specializing in cotton t-shirts from North Carolina, and his activism is using American-made fabric and American workers in the shop. More than this, he powers all his company vehicles with biodiesel. We met up with Eric, not just at Green Festival, but many other alternative big events in the U.S. The Green Festival organizers expanded their project from Austin, Texas to Chicago to New York. We partnered with the organization and organizers and sponsored the events, and we attended many of them for several years. At one of these events, David Suzuki was a keynote speaker. And sometimes something someone says almost offhandedly gets under your skin and makes you ruminate for some time after the comment is made. But what David said while he was summoned through the book center table 
casting his eye around the massive, massive hall with tons of exhibitors and stuff for sale. He says, he said, um, sure there's a lot of consuming going on here. Casting, uh, this was a new light, and I believe it's right. Were we all trying to green shop our way out of our eco footprint problem? Green festivals were at the home events we went to. The Midwest Renewable Energy Fair in Custer, Wisconsin, held in the field in a few barns, was a favorite for years. Here was an event that again annually drew about 14,000 people, many camping in the, uh, in, you know, for the weekend. Meeting these folks really helped our business grow. We met up with current authors and acquired several others. And Soul Fest in Northern California was another fabulous experience. This event in its heyday, heyday drew well over 10,000 people and completely powered by solar arrays with many demonstration sites because the venue was actually a functioning solar training center. This was a celebration of the alternative culture. Our location, three long tables, was right alongside the main stage. It just doesn't get any better. On Saturday night, there was a lot of music and a dance band. And of course, it was hot and dry. We sold books. We drank beer and danced under the stars. People left joints on our table. <laughs> we were, after all, the little humble county. <laughs> to develop new strategy, new categories of books, we attended those kinds of events. For example, the U.S. Green Building Council's annual trade show and conference. Not exactly an alternative event, like Soul Fest and Green Festival. But our hunch was that green building interests would cross over into natural building and renewable energy. We met many of the key players. And aside from the bookstore on site, books and book publishers were not represented at all. The field was wide open for us. We signed Alex Wilson, David Johnson, Jerry Udelson, all key players in the Green Building Movement, and a few others before the big publishers took notice of what was happening. By the second year, Taunton and others were sidling up to our table saying, how do you do this? At one of the last USG, GS, USGBC events that we went to, we were featuring Athena Thompson's uh, Books, book, her, her new book, Homes That Heal, in the Bass Trade Show Hall in Portland, Oregon, when Athena actually collapsed, and I too felt ill. The place was so toxic, from all the show infrastructure, the temporary carpeting, especially much of the green building projects produced air quality that smelled like a chemical factory. <laughs> I think we went to one more after that in Atlanta, and then green building actually became a little less attractive to us. We preferred natural building. And we still do, but we have learned a lot. Somewhere along the line, we met Libba and Gifford Pinchot from Bainbridge Island. They are a dedicated team of green business educators and consultants, as well as being active local participants in, in environmental issues. I mention them because Libba, possibly unknown to her, was a significant influence on our thinking about how to run our business. More accurately, her thinking actually affirmed much of our own gut feelings about our relationship to staff. The Philadelphians had been a diehard consensus decision-making, collectively organized group of radicals. We thought that this may have contributed, at least partially, to their demise, but partly because there was no accountability built into their structure. And Kip and I had also been involved in several groups and organizations where decisions were made collectively. And while we wholeheartedly agreed in theory, sometimes the practice was maybe not the most appropriate uh, way to go. Our thinking with our version of New Society Publishers was that we would have a benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> <laughs> Everything we owned, now and in the foreseeable future, was backing New Society Publishers. And we were treading very carefully, as this felt like our one and only chance to make a go of it. Linda said, if you can't hire family, make them family. And this is just what we were doing. Right from the beginning, we knew we wanted to work in a company ourselves that was internally sustainable, and that our long-term viability was more important than a stout bottom line. And we had spent enough time living in community to know that caring for each other on a daily basis provided real security. Perhaps the most important policy that we have ever created was that of family first. If your child is ill, of course you stay home. If your father passes away, of course you take the time you need to heal from your loss. There have rarely been any questions around any of our staff's ability to take the time that they need to care for their lives at home. We offer six weeks paid holidays a year, plus 10 days at winter solstice. Most people have the option of working some of the week on their home offices. And as soon as we could afford it, 
we offered him an extended medical package. After successful years, we gave employees generous after-tax bonuses. By 2006, New Society Publishers was flourishing. The state of the world was, however, ominous. George W. Bush in the U.S. The subject of peak oil was at the top of the charts as far as our book sales were concerned. Richard Heinberg's message began to resonate. He argued that we had to power down to get ready for a worldwide shortage of oil, that dark substance that fuels our economy and that in turn pollutes the atmosphere and enables our society to enrich the 1% and impoverish most of the world's population, while simultaneously disrupting the delicate balance of ecosystems everywhere. We cynically would mutter under our breath that the worse things got, the more books we sold. People came up to our book tables over and over again saying that they wanted every book on the table, often brought tears with their own despair at the state of things. It turned out to be a very big move on our part to turn towards our readers and authors. All around us, the book publishing business was changing. People imagined book publishing to be an almost leisurely intellectual business. This may have been true a hundred years ago, but today we are a media company in a highly aggressive and competitive capitalist context. From the late 90s on, small bookstores were being consumed by big box stores at an alarming rate, and big box stores in turn were gouging the publishers demanding deep discounts because of their large orders. The new practice of ordering hundreds of copies or thousands of a title, I believe, was to fill the share of shelves of warehouse-sized stores, that is to say, paper the walls. Now, this is actually a chart that shows you what happens to the price of a book. And you can see we put in a standard discount of 45%. Well, in fact, Amazon get 59. So just adjust the pie. So the new practice of ordering hundreds of copies or thousands of the title, I believe, was to pay the, so these warehouse sized stores could pay for the walls with our product. Practices that display books like facing the covers out rather than spying in or placing books at the end of shelves, all were now services being charged back to the publishers. In days gone by, real booksellers like Honor Books, and they still do, organize their books according to the tastes of their customers. Now the publishers have to pay to be noticed at every turn. Most new books don't sell huge stacks. We all knew what was coming. Returns. Truckloads, indeed, trainloads. In some cases, the books would come back to us, sometimes just thrown in boxes with no packing, and we were charged for processing the returns for the shipping. In fact, we paid to ship the books to them in the first place, paid to have them sent free to customers, and then paid shipping to get them back again. And just as the big box stores invoices was due, we would be hit by returns. Another nightmare scenario that publishers have to deal with is reprinting. All the inventory from a title has been bought, that is to say, is sitting in a, in a big box store or worse in their warehouse, and we have no inventory. The book needs to be reprinted because our warehouse is empty and there's demand from wholesalers. The reality often is that just as the reprint rolls off press, the big box stores will return their stock of all the titles, of the, of the titles, sending cases of the same title back to us. It's an easy way for them to pay their bill, and we've seen them return, and we order almost days later. Publishers have tried to deal with this archaic practice of returns. Originally, book publishers were gentlemen of wealth and offered the return policy to booksellers so the booksellers could try out the new title. Now we can't get rid of the abusive system. As individual businesses, we could simply decide not to sell or not to accept returns, uh, but most likely we wouldn't sell any books to chapters, uh, and, and often they're the only store in town. So this is a risk that our authors would simply not accept. So, and as a consortium of publishers, we are not legally allowed to organize to collectively resist this practice. We would be colluding, and of course that's illegal. Most publishers, that's crazy, most publishers do not sell directly to, to booksellers, only the huge and mighty who themselves are owned by the super high and mighty. Independent publishers have distributors. As mentioned earlier, we were originally distributed by, distributed by General, a division of Stoddart, in Canada and in book in the US. In the late 90s, GDS and Stoddart fell into financial chaos. Almost simultaneously, so did InBook. Fortunately, at InBook, we had an agreement that allowed us to get our books out of the warehouse before the place was locked down by creditors. With most of our stock in the US, we narrowly escaped the financial ruin that befell many other small presses. 
We lost some books and money on the GDS fall, but nothing like some of the larger Canadian houses did. It was a, it was a difficult time. We managed to reorganize ourselves for the better in the end. We took on our own Canadian distribution and moved to Consortium, a seemingly solid company in the US. We really liked doing our own distribution in Canada, and it grew nicely. Julie took it on in 1998, starting originally out of her basement. When they moved to a larger house, what was the garage was converted into a book packing plant. Soon we had to rent storage space as well. Invoices came from our office on Gabriola to her fax machine or computer in an item during the day, and in the evening, several women in the neighborhood showed up to pack the books. It was a very efficient and happy situation. We liked being directly in touch with the booksellers, and there's nothing more satisfying than seeing a pallet or several pallets of well-packed boxes of books being picked up in the morning by Canada Post. Only because Julie was so well-organized well did this system work. It was marginal, though. She lives in a residential neighborhood, and between deliveries and pickups, we knew we were pushing the limits of our book violence. But we had narrowly escaped the devastating consequence of the little man downfall. And we, were, we felt we were doing our job, providing tools for building a new society. But by 2006, Kip and I were growing weary and really wanted to put some of these tools that we, in our books into practice in our own lives. How to move on personally became a question that surfaced over and over again for us. We researched it. How to sell a publishing company? Who to sell it to? The grain of the publishing business is a serious question in Canada, with so many of the original publishers reaching retirement years. We had no answers, and the more we thought about it, the fewer avenues we could find. In May of that year, Kip and I set up the book table at the World Urban Forum in Vancouver. Delegates came from Cuba, Africa, Holland, Australia, Germany, China, Japan, everywhere imaginable. It was an amazing event, and our table was set up right outside the conference hall. The event was five days long. Every night, we had to request that more books be sent to us from the Nanaimo warehouse, as we sold them daily. I think we sent about $20,000 worth of books around the world as a consequence. But it was here that I noticed that Kit couldn't write legibly on the credit card slips, and he grew very weary in the afternoons. A few weeks later, our doc sent him to a neurologist in Victoria. It was Parkinson's disease, and though his health would worsen, we were told it was unlikely that he would die from it more likely died with it. This was the tipping point for us, as our lives began inexorably to take a turn toward a change that would make everything different. It took two years until 2008 to first firmly decide to let go of New Society publishers, <laughs> and then agree to sell to Douglas and McIntyre, an established mid-sized BC publisher. If it hadn't have been for Kip's health, we probably would have procrastinated and not given in to DNM's long courtship. But we felt we had to turn our energy towards Kip's Parkinson's disease, this new elephant in the living room, giving it the same dedicated energy that we had given to New Society publishers. So on a glorious day in September of that year, the deal having been finalized a few weeks prior, all of the DNM staff and their partners arrived at our home office on Gabriola to celebrate the coming together of the three imprints, Douglas and McIntyre, Greystone, and New Society Publishers. It was a day filled with optimism for most of us and relief for Kip and I. After the sale, I agreed to stay on as publisher with Kip taking less and less of an active role. We shut down the Canadian fulfillment center in Nanaimo and moved our inventory to HarperCollins, taking advantage of the favorable terms offered by HC because of the combined sales levels of the three DNN imprints. We didn't like letting go of our direct relationship with booksellers in the happy Nanaimo warehouse scene, but we felt that we were now cahoots with a major Canadian book publisher who knew the subtle details of the business better than we did, had better contacts in the industry and media in Canada, and their decisions, like bunking in with Harper Collins, would only make us appear to be more professional. We were warned by our accountant and lawyer, however, that DNM were essentially buying the company with our own money. Not quite understanding this, we moved forward, convinced that this arrangement would help to streamline our operations and that we would collaborate between them's team, and that all in all, NSP would be able to move successfully into the mainstream. At the first management meeting that Kip and I attended, the DNAM's upper level team, including past and present owners in their boardroom, we presented our forthcoming list of titles. We don't need or want to see this, they said. And later, we were also told that they didn't really care what we did, as long as we were happy. 
Meanwhile, our bookkeeper was constantly distressed as every extra cent from our bank account was sent to head office. Kip and I were disappointed, to say the least, but we carried on. Always keeping a separate set of books with an audited financial statement every year, we knew that NSP was holding its own. DNM didn't interfere one way or another, and we did publish what we wanted to. It was 2008, and the financial world was in crisis. Shouldn't we be strategizing for the coming serious collapse of the world economy, we urged our parent company? After all, we had recently published several titles that laid out the downfall of world markets coupled with climate change and other environmental issues. These titles included Gardening When It Counts by Steve Solomon, The Party is Over and Power Down, both by Richard Heinberg, and the damning and controversial Crossing the Rubicon by Michael Rupert, all leading to hardship and suffering for many, many people. These and many other books published by us and other publishers all point to the fact that society was indeed crumbling and that the consequences would be devastating. Gardening When It Counts, for example, was selling 250 copies a week on Amazon alone. People were taking the news to heart and the situation into their own and their community's hands. But d &M just kept on overstating their sales and ours and borrowing from the banks. And there was nothing we could do about it but carry on with our work. Couldn't you be a bit more optimistic, said DNM's CFO, about my projections for the coming year? We knew our industry would be taking a hit, and we didn't know if we should batten down the hatches or go with the theory that the worse things got, the greater our sales, the latter strategy feeling just a little arrogant. Bookstores were closing faster than ever, and those that remained, even the big box superstores, were ordering less. People just weren't buying like they used to. This was understandable given the soaring unemployment and foreclosure rates. And then it happened. Chapters Indigo started closing stores. DM sold most of their books in Canada, and with the loss of the independent booksellers, losing the Chapters Indigo stores was disastrous. When returns outnumber sales, any book publisher can hang on for only so long. Print bills, the banks, Authors all were breathing down DNM's neck. Truckloads of books were being sent back, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. Up against the wall, DNM finally was forced into a corner and had to declare insolvency. Our little company, along with the DNM and Greystone imprints, were locked down by the bank. All of this was slowly revealed to us. We knew something was seriously wrong when our longtime allies at Friesen's, our colleagues in so many ways, suddenly pushed all our print dates ahead. In other words, they refused to print anything that wasn't prepaid. In our business, this is almost impossible. In fact, it is impossible. And though we managed to get some of our reprints and front lists to press, others had to wait in limbo. That was August 2012. Staff were walking to work like hangdogs. Morale, always robust, had plummeted to an all-time low. Kip and I knew live a little more than they did, but just enough to know that we had no answers and the future of New Society Publishers was in danger. Rob Sanders, publisher at Greystone, had taken on the publisher role for me in 2011 when I had decided that I really needed to be more at home. He was caught between a rock and a hard place. He had spent decades building Greystone into what it had become, a publisher of fine books some environmentally oriented through his work with the David Suzuki Foundation and many award-winning titles, a savvy publisher and an all-round nice guy. We had felt that he could relieve me while simultaneously looking for someone to take up the leadership reins at NSP. During the bank bankruptcy process, he was privy to more information than we were, but not all of it. It was a fearful place for both Rob and ourselves because we knew the banks were looking for a bottom feeder a company that would buy the business for pennies, let go of the stock, and sell off the inventory at bargain prices. A sale to a bottom feeder would be the end of New Society Publishers, the end of a long legacy of activist work, and another nail in the coffin for one of Canada's few, some would say only, politically alternative press. It was at this point that I realized we had taken on New Society Publishers from the Philadelphians as an act of trust. When they handed over the business to us, we were receiving a legacy of work that had, had from the very outset represented the struggles of resistance to colonization, to war, to patriarchy, to violence, and whose books gave people the tools to resist nonviolently and the strategies to reorganize. 
New Society's publisher's engagement with this work was and is a real part of the long story of freedom. We were holding in trust the work of past and present activists, authors, and we knew that we must survive to publish the work of future generations of activists and readers. In the conglomerating capitalist world, where the bottom line is the measure of all things, what we tenu tenuously held was much, much bigger than any of us, than even the professional lives of Kip and I and our staff. For if not an independent, vision-driven, passionate organization like New Society Publishers, then who would be deciding what would make it to press and what wouldn't? And on what grounds would those decisions be made? The answer to that question was clear as the sharks circled. By January, we had the most two weeks before it was going to be a done deal. The banks don't care about the history of freedom or resistance to the man. They wanted money and as much as they could get. Whoever could pay the most would win. NSP staff and ourselves pulled out all the stops. So-and-so's mother could come up with some money. Maybe we could get some bank loans. Maybe we could come up with a few hundred thousand. But in two weeks, how can we possibly come up with a structure that would give us the confidence to put this much money forward? One night, Julie, now the chief operating officer, stayed late, trying to draft an agreement that would work for everybody. It was a dark time. I found her in tears at her desk. That was it. I knew in an instant what had to be done. Kip and I had to dig into our retirement money and do everything we could to buy the company back. It was as clear as a bell to me that this was the way to go. Once again, we were charged up, just as we had been years ago in Isadora's. The next day, I called Joel Solomon. Unbeknownst to me, Carol and Joel and their colleagues had also been wondering what could be done about the situation. So my call sparked the conversation of, once again, partnering with Renewal. Within hours, Carol and Joel was on board. When a decision is the right one, things start to fall into place like dominoes. We had to tread carefully. We could not fail. Dealing with the banks, brokers was frightening, but we were brave, all of us. And we got it back. Traumatized, we took stock. We had no money, but we did have some prepaid print bills. We had a front list and we had a catalog. No one had missed a day's pay. Our team was energized and we were back in business with hardly hiccup to the outside world. And that was, I don't know, 20 months ago. So um, Julie has actually written the conclusion to this talk, but I'm going to deliver it. So this is by Julie. A business in transition is an amazing thing. Within a span of two years, we found ourselves moving from the unsettled, dark, and gloomy days of a fairly significant bankruptcy to holding the future in our hands. Although at times over the last couple of years, it felt like doors were closing all around us, they really were opening. And with the buyback of New Society Publishers in February of 2013, an amazing opportunity slowly began to unfold. The rest of 2013 was spent in recovery, regrouping, and taking stock. We considered the future of NSP, and Carol graciously stepped back and allowed us to ponder what was going to be next. We slowly got our feet back on the ground, and I couldn't help but feel that this long transition the company seemed to be stuck in was coming to an end. We were back in a secure financial position with owners who were encouraging a new business structure and forward thinking. The staff contemplated various ownership strategies, but to be honest, the depth of knowledge required to understand the detailed intricacies of business was not the forte of any of us. And the day-to-day -day work of a publishing house was all-consuming. Although we all knew change was in the air and ideas came and went, we had no idea what the future would look like. During this time, I had a mantra. The business felt like the little engine that could, chugging up a very steep hill and I would tell myself to just keep going. Move up that hill, even if only by an inch at a time, but just don't let it slip back. We could do it, I told myself, and we did. Since February of 2013, the words in my head have changed. We can be more. We can do something better with this business, something amazing. We were already pretty good at being a mindful business, but a door had opened, and this was our chance to make a change. Be more. 
be better. We can do it. But how? In the early summer of this year, the shareholders dedicated themselves to the goal of creating a model that took sustainable, sustainability, eth sustainable ethical and moral business principles into consideration after an exciting meeting with some of the wisest people I have ever had the privilege to meet, we came up with a plan, an exciting plan, a different plan, but it's the beginning of making a huge difference. On September 22nd, the shareholders presented the draft of a new shareholders agreement that now included an employee ownership strategy. The agreement offered employees a stake in the company through a trust. Suddenly, in the living room of my parents' house, 11 staff members realized we were being off offered off ownership in the company. Not just a paying dividend, but a trust to be managed by employees in a position on the board of directors and a very strong and active role in the direction of the company. The future was being placed in the hands of the people who had poured their blood, sweat, and yes, tears into the company. The feeling was amazing. Staff lingered in the house long after working hours. The dry waste board was covered with the criteria and positions available for both the trust and the company's board of directors. The wheels are definitely in motion. Ownership of a business. What is that anyhow? As my mom mentioned earlier, my parents both saw themselves as holding the company in trust. In those early days when it moved on to a big Gulf Island in BC, they carried it into the next chapter of its life. They loved, cared for, and nurtured this company and have done so for many years, allowing it to be successful, meaningful, and shared by so many people. Now, in the future years, alongside of them, of all the dedicated and passionate staff who are committed to the mission of this company, and being the little company that does. It's, just, it's not just providing the tools for a world of change, but is, in itself, a tool for change, dedicated to helping you walk the talk while it, too, walks the talk. We are so excited to be starting this new chapter. Publishing these days is a crazy mixed up industry in an even crazier world, but we are one hell of a company. Wait until you see our next season. And please, touch the books. They may even change your life. They have all of ours. <laughs>